stall just a hair, um, that'll probably work. So, Sue, how are you doing? I've not, I've not seen you in a while. I know, I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for making it. I saw Steve oh, here somewhere yeah, too. Yeah, Steve's but. on too. Yeah, I'm George Close's daughter. So okay. I have many, many, many memories of the whole gang on the Wolf River. So it's just going to be a walk down memory lane with all of you tonight. Cool. Winston. <clears throat> Hello. How all right. are you doing, Winston? Good. Jason, how are you? Good. Glad you're here. Um, well, Andy, you, uh, whenever you are ready, you can take the show and, um, probably the easiest thing for Andy's got a bunch of slides together. Um, easiest thing is probably to turn cameras off once he gets going on that. Um, you can mute yourselves as well. And if you want to step in, I assume he's fine with just kind of letting you tell a story or share whatever as we get there. Um, just remember to unmute. So the those are down in the bottom left corner, the stop video and the mute. You just hit the buttons and it'll, it'll do each. So on that, I'm going to stop my video and I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to let Andy take over. Hey, Thank you. question. Am I in this? We see you. Yes, you are, Jim. I'm sorry? Yes, you are. OK, just checking. So how come people keep showing up on my screen? Is that whenever they talk? Yeah, yeah. So you can change up top if you want the view. Um, if you go to speaker view, then it'll just change between whoever's talking. OK. At the time. Then that's fine. Um, otherwise, you can do it the whatever the other view they call is. the where you see all the tiles. So, where is the speaker view? It is up, it's up to the top, it just says view. And if you hit view, it'll give you a choice of gallery view or speaker view. Okay. So like I have it on speaker view, so I see Andy and Steve, and then everyone else is just a little box at the top. Yeah. And on the bottom too, just before we get going, um, you can see all the participants by clicking on the participants thing. And you can see the chat stuff that's there um, as well. So you can kind of control your own screen. Um, although here fairly soon, Andy's gonna kind of have our screens because he's gonna share um, his screen. Yes, I will. And, so uh, that's anybody, the last I'm talking. I'm gonna mute myself for a bit. Anybody that wants to feel free to ask questions or chat, whichever. Well, I'm just looking to see if I know anybody. <laughs> so let's get started here. Appreciate everybody coming tonight. Uh, we're gonna, you know, run down a little history of the Wolf River. Some of the people that, you know, were here before us. Uh, a little bit of the history, flies, people, stuff like that. So if anybody got any questions ever, just feel free to ask. Um, the Wolf River itself uh, starts, and it's my cheat sheet here, starts at the confluence of Wild Creek and Pine Creek, which is up near Pine Lake in Forest County, just west of Argonne. From there, it flows 225 miles where it meets the Fox River in the Lake Lake Butamore near Winniconne. And eventually that water flows up the Fox to the, the Bay of Green Bay. Uh, the trout water of the Wolf pretty much ends in the, the Menominee Indian Reservation, um, probably towards the middle of it, maybe all the way down, I'm not sure. But you know, we're, the parts we're worried about are the upper end why doesn't my screen change here? Okay, I was looking for a different one, but we'll get yeah. started with this. this is I will uh, just talk real quick and I kind of put this in 
because I knew um, Steve and Sue were going to join us. And I kind of wanted a chance to have them introduce themselves. So um, if you organize these things, you get to pick what we do. So I have a connection to the wolf, and that's kind of one of the reasons I chose this. Um, so that is a young Tim Landweir, by the way. I love that photo of, of Tim. Who's, speak, um, who's speaking now? Uh, Jason Freund. Is there an image up here somewhere of him? Uh, I think I turned my camera off. So, okay. um, so he's, yeah, Andy's got control here. Um, so yeah, I caught my first ever trout with George. We went over to one of those O'Connell River streams. I remember coming back to the cottage and frying up a couple of trout and stuff like that. So that was like, I was 12, I think. So it was always kind of fun times getting up to the to the cottage on the Wolf River. I <clears throat> built my first fly rod. I tied my first flies. I learned to cast all that stuff from George. So that's kind of my connection and one of the reasons I wanted to do this one in particular. So um, can you go next, Andy? So that's the cottage and I don't know, Sue, Steve, if you want to say a word or two, probably have to unmute, but. Uh, right, we, um, let's see, we used to always camp at Caps since, you know, I was born in 1959. So I think I was two, at least when we started camping. And, um, and then, you know, when he sold to the, to the state, we were able to buy a piece of property right across the river um, from Fritz Bittner. And yeah, it was, this, <laughs> this was our cabin. It was intended to be the um, garage, you know, those, the whole space there was meant to be garage doors because we thought maybe at one point we'd build. Um, but that was probably built by Neil Sandwich um in about like 1980 1981 i remember i was in college and came and helped put the carpeting in so that's our little cottage a cabin it's still there you still own it still own it yeah my parents have my dad has passed away about uh in april it'll be six years my mom five years ago and so yeah the kids still still own it and and visit Good. Cool. And your brother is on here? Your husband? Yep, my brother Steve is on. Okay, he's being quiet. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, this is, that's George. Later in life, I don't know what year this was taken, but. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, where was this located again? This picture was probably on the Menominee River. Oh. It was being guided by Tim Landwehr from Tight Lines Fly Shop. Yeah, and I asked Tim to, to help tonight, but he is bow hunting this weekend. So last yeah. weekend of bow season. So he's, he's down the southwest at his cabin hanging out with his family. Yep. So, but all right, there's the cabin again. So this is a picture of uh, Pine Lake where the Wolf River starts. And uh, it flows from here. And then the very bottom of the screen, you can see it says Rice Lake. It's called Little Rice Lake. It, it ends up flowing through there also. Uh, meanders down south a little more and then enters Post Lake where there's a dam at the south end. And so the water up there is still on the warm side because it's coming out of, you know, coming over dams out of the lake. Um, after it gets down below Post Lake, the hunting river joins in. And from there, that's where a, a good share of the uh, Wolf River cold water comes from. Oh, this is a this is a picture of the Wolf River taken today. That's the old Bittner Motel there on the right. Uh, still pretty frozen, but it's winter. There's a picture looking south. That's pretty wide open, but you know, it's I'm sure it's still cold in there. So uh Langlade was a big logging community back then. I don't really know where this was on the Wolf. Uh, it came out of a, an article that said this was the Wolf River somewhere. But uh, at one time there was, I believe, eight or nine, 10 dams on the Wolf River uh, from the headwaters to Shano. So um, you can find some of those remnant of those dams uh, just downstream from Lily. 
And that's probably on what is now the Menominee Indian Reservation. This one here? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, there is some places and, you know, there was a, there was a dam right there in, uh, in Langley, you know, right outside Cap's house at one time. There was one in there. This is, uh, I have, we have no idea if this came from the wolf or not, but it's just an old picture that used to hang in the Wolf River Lodge and uh, just shows, you know, a guy with his daily catch of fish. So almost like Travis catches. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this is, yeah, this is kind of the, the hub that is laying light. And that's, this is kind of the central area of the Wolf River. People, you know, you start out from here and such. And there's, there's several access points along the way. Not, not a ton of them. Um, it's hard to walk in between access points from one to the, to the next. But uh, it can be done, and I know some people have done it too. And this is up the, up the road, Hollister. Uh, down there, there's good access down there. My family actually has an old cottage up there, and the relatives still own it. Um, I'm not part of it anymore. But uh, we have, I have, my family's got a lot of rich history from up in this way. If you're familiar with the area, there's a Nine Mile Tavern. My parents actually met at the Nine Mile Tavern back in 1948. So uh, there's one of our bigger Wolf River Browns. I believe Tim Waters caught this a few years back. It lo definitely looks like a spring fish with the vegetation the way it is. And here's our resident rainbow chaser, Travis. He loves to catch the rainbows and he, he works pretty hard at it. So, and just a small representative of the there's brook trout in there too. They're not always huge, but uh, they're fun to catch. And they're, they're still, those are all natural reproducing. They don't stock any brook trout in here at all. Here's another brook trout, a nicer size one. Yeah, that one ran about 12 inches on an articulated streamer. I've seen uh, seen brook trout and caught brook trout in the wolf up to 14. So there's definitely some uh, decent brookies in there. Yeah, and there, there was a story from a few years back. One of the other guys caught a couple of really big ones in the spring. For like two days in a row, he caught some really nice brook trout and then he didn't catch any more. So I'm, you know, 16, 17 inch brook trout. So they are around. Uh, this goes way back. In the 50s, there was a group from Milwaukee called Waiters of the Wolf. And it was a group of people that liked to fish and they liked to fish the Wolf River, but they were all from Milwaukee. But they started their own club and they would have meetings down in Milwaukee. They'd get together and, you know, have meetings, probably just drink beer and stuff. Um, and then they would, they would have outings where they'd come up to the Wolf and stay. And I think they disbanded about 1960. But by chance, we ran into one of the relatives that contacted us and donated a bunch of these patches, original patches of the waiters on the wolf. So these are all 60, 70 years old, those patches. That is not a trout, <laughs> smallmouth bass. The uh, Wolf River is has a good population of smallmouth bass and some really nice ones. I think Bill Livingston caught this one and that's probably 17 or 18 inch smallmouth right there. So it's not the greatest picture in the world. I don't know if this is the same fish or not, um, but it's still a nice representation. And it's also in a net made by Neil Sandwich, who was one of the locals who lived on the river there. And, and he's the one that built George Close's house, his cabin up there. Um, he was a retired house builder from Oshkosh and they used to spend their weekends up on the Wolf and then they retired up there in 71, 72, I think it was. And uh, Neil needed something to do. So he started building nets and uh, became quite good at it. Um, and this is the famed area I wanna call it 
this little road, this is Highway 55, Lang Light stoplights are up the top there, but there's a road, it's called Rocky Rips Road. And you pull in on Rocky Rips Road, you make the left corner and down a ways is, was Cap Bittner's fly shop. And next door to Cap was Bob Talasek, who later, after uh, Cap closed up his shop, started his own fly shop. And a couple houses down, I think it was over in this way, Ed Haga, who, was a, who did a lot of the tying for Cap Bittner, had a house. So there was a lot of good stuff in that area. And also George Close's cabin, I believe is over in this area here, uh, across the river coming in off another road. But- uh, oh, So Andy, where was, Cap, where was Cap's fly shop on the, on, with that? I remember it next to the, pretty close to the river actually, right? Yeah, it was on, they, they all lived on the river. Can you see my mouse pointer on yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. It was in here somewhere. It was okay. one of these houses along in here. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure which one. Okay. Um, and yeah, the story goes, well, Cap had the fly shop. Bob Talisek was his friend who I believe Bob tied flies for Cap. Uh, so when Cap closed up his shop, Bob next door started his. And I've got some photos later of the signs. They left the same signs out on the road. They just changed the name at the top. They didn't even, oh, bother. Okay. They didn't even bother moving them. They were right next to each other, but not in the same building. No, they were not in the same building. Mm -hmm. and they never were. Because I remember that fly shop looked a lot like that cabin. Kind of was a brown building. I, I don't, you know, it's been so long. I was in, I was in them once, but it was a long, long time ago. Um, I, I, you know, I remember meeting Cap, but I was young. And I, I don't, didn't even fly fish in. Yeah, and there's uh, Dan Farron, who was very helpful with a lot of information, has one of the original uh, patches from Cap's Fly Shop. Um, yeah, Dan used to spend a lot of time up there too and hang out with, you know, he said he would hang out in Cap's Fly Shop with Cap and, and uh, Bob Talisak and uh, Gary Borger. And those guys would sit and talk and Dan would listen. <laughs> Yeah, here's the, here's the sign that was on Highway 55. Um, after Bob closed up the shop, the signs were there and I, I talked to his wife and I said, would, you know, could I have those signs? And she goes, oh, would you take those down for me? And I said, yes, I would. So I kept them on too. And if you look where it says Wolf River, that's a little bit different shade. But if you look underneath, there's a C and an A and a P and an S for Caps Fly Shop. So they just pulled the other boards off and put new Wolf River fly shops on there. It's the only part they changed. And this arrow board here, if you turn it over, it says caps on the other side. That's hanging in my shed. And this was the other way. So when you're coming up 55 going towards Langley, this, this was the first sign you'd see, you know, pointing down Rocky Rips Road. But if you were coming from the north, from town, there was just this sign, fly shop 400 feet. That was right there by Rocky Rips Road. This is a picture of Cap Bittner. And I believe that is in George Close's cabin. Is that That's right? correct. Yeah. That's, that's in the cabin. One cool story about Cap Bittner, of course, again, we used to camp almost every weekend up there and we you know would go inner tubing and of course uh fishing and uh, he used to pay us you know my brother sister and i uh we used to be able to get a candy bar out of his shop by cleaning up the wolf river on either side so we'd go up you know with our tennis shoes on and clean up the beer cans and you know litter and everything else so and he'd, he'd give us a candy bar oh nice so where was his campsites at? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was right on the river. By his house? So, right by his house, sure. Right, okay. um, but, but on the river, right by his, the fly shop. Okay. Mm -hmm. so um, did did you know the, the Brackubs, Les and Leah Brackub? They had a cabin and then right down the river, there were, you know, I don't know, a number of campsites. That's how we met the Talisacs too. Okay. And we used to play with Talisac girls. Okay. Yeah. All right. Huh, that's interesting. 
-hmm. And there's a there's a plaque on a rock um, in in memory of Cap. And talking to a lot of people, nobody knows where this rock is. So if anybody knows where this is, we would like to find out. Now there's a there is a plaque for Cap, and I think it says the same thing that's down by the old motel there on the corner. But that's kind of in the yard there. Um, but th somebody sent me this picture. I'm not quite sure where I got it from, but uh, nobody remembers where this actually of this rock is. So I don't know if it's- Yeah, I might be able to help you out. Well, I'll take a look uh, next time I go up and let Jason know. I, I have a feeling yeah. it might be by that bench. There's a bench he used to sit at, which is kind of just up from the, uh, the DNR land. If you go straight in off of Rocky Rip, you go straight ahead, that's DNR land. But once you hit the river and you go north, that's private property. And I've got a feeling it might be up in there. I was there today, Andy. Yeah? I, yeah, this is Bill. I was there today. I had some pretty good directions from Cap Bettner's uh, daughter-in-law, if you will. She gave me some directions to down in that area and I, I can't find a rock that big. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is gonna be a mystery in, for a while. Huh, all right. Did you walk up by the, where the old bench was? Yeah. Is and it, then uh, it's, the it's private there? property. It's, it's owned by uh, Jepson. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure of Mr. Jepson's first name. Um, but he recollected it was downstream also. And I walked downstream from the DNR access to Herb Bettner's um, turnaround where he put uh, rafts and canoes and stuff in and out. Okay. And there's not a rock that big on that side of the river in that area. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I had another conversation with Bill Kellner uh, later on in the day and we're just, bewildered yeah, that's good gotta have a mystery now and then yeah. we'll find it <laughs> uh -oh. sue do you still have that table in your cabin we sure do you know that's we made my my dad and and I, all of us made the the furniture so we saw that's white cedar and we have you know their bed twin beds are made out of that the cool chair is a uh, horse i mean uh, um uh, what do you call that? Um, snowshoe, a snowshoe chair. Okay. What it, yeah, what is that Naga hide they use for the stretching? Yes, for the raw hide. Yeah, okay. Raw hide, you're right. Okay, well, that's cool. That's very interesting. And Thank if you, you could see behind the chair was my dad's fly tying desk. Oh, sure. You could see the lamp and a few things. Sure. <laughs> huh. Very nice. There's a picture of Cap out on the river. This is the one that hangs up in the tight line shop. So this is Cap's gauge. People would call him and say, how's the river? And he'd go, you know, he'd say, I don't know. So Cap built himself a gauge and pounded it in out there. Don't even know what it's made of, it looks heavy. Um, so then when people call him, say what it is, he say he could tell them, oh, it's at 18. And actually the rafters kind of are notorious for that, especially the older rafters. Kayakers, you know, when they ask what the river's at, that's what they want to know. They want to know caps gauge. They don't want to know the, you know, cubic feet per second. So, and that's, that's still in its spot there, found it in the river. Yeah, this is that same, just another picture of that same one. So. Bill, does the, uh, there's a plaque up by the motel. Does this, is it the same as this or is it different wording? <laughs> well, that's a good story too. <laughs> there's, there's another plaque at the motel and it has nothing to do with Cap Bettner. Oh, really? I thought it did. Yeah. Not huh? Well, there might there might be another one down closer to the river, but I always thought the one you're talking about was right to the left of the motel, 
and I drove in there today, and there is a plaque there, but it has nothing to do with CAP. Um, that's, that's for that historical. It was a memory of somebody, somebody, and then it just said tight lines on it. Oh, okay. So there's another mystery. All right. Well, that's good. All right. We're not solving anything then today. Did you get any information from Clyde Park about it? No, he couldn't remember either. Okay. This is a picture of Ed Haga. And Ed was, Ed was the tire for Caps fly shop. He tied, I don't know about all of them, he tied a lot of the flies uh, for him. Cap didn't tie. <laughs> he just owned a fly shop and could talk to people. And uh, these are some framed ones. And I believe Dan Farron did all these for, for Ed. This is Ed when he was in his later years. There he is a little younger sitting at his bench there with all his materials out and boxes and- You've gotten that one. What's that? You can hear him. Yeah, I can hear you, but I lost your picture. This oh, Dan. hey Dan, I can see you. Good, glad you could join us. Hold on, I gotta figure out how to get back to where I was. <laughs> Invite maybe. Dan used to hang around up there at the Wolf. I don't. I don't know, Dan. I... Steve, any suggestions? Just talk to him. Yeah, you don't have his picture. Uh, yeah, but I want to see. You. We can see you, Dan. I know, but I I clicked on something and I got everybody that's on on a page, but I lost the picture. Go back up in the corner. Uh, something about grid view. About what? Upper upper right corner of the box. There should be a grid view and some something else. Nope. No? Oh. It should say speaker it view up mute. there. Speaker view, yeah. It says mute or more. Well, I'm going to keep going here. You'll get that figured out. Good to have you on, though. There's a picture, Ed, and I believe that, uh, I think I got that from you, Jason, that said this was his biggest brown trout from the wolf. You did. I got that from Betty, George's uh, wife. Yeah. 23 inches or something like that. Yeah, if I hadn't done it, I'll send you the Excel file with all the uh, explanations of the photos in them. Uh, you did that. I, I do have that. Um, about There's about a half a dozen photos or so. And yeah, you sent me a, a list of what they are. So. I got your ball. I'm back on. Good. It's Ed. Yeah, that's Ed. So and there's George. George. George behind his vice and at his Jeep. There. You don't have the Jeep yet, do you? Long gone. Uh, okay, yeah, they don't last that long. <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of neat. That's a good it's a good vehicle for up there. So and there's a picture of Cap and a younger George. This is back at your cabin, right? It is, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lamp in the back. And they're discussing flies, as fly fishermen do. And there's a picture of Cap and Ed going over something. So. And this is up at uh, Tight Lines, hanging on the wall up there. It's Bob Talisak's cards, uh, his business cards. Wolf River Fly Shop, formerly Caps. So, <laughs> only open on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. <laughs> Custom built rods. And I don't know, Bob, I, I know uh, Jim Doc Curry built the rods for, for Cap. I don't know if he built them for Bob, too, or not. That I don't know. But. And these are some framed flies that, that Dan Farron did. 
or I, I don't know this one, is this uh, Wolf River flies, Dan? Uh, quite a few of the flies on here are Ed's. Uh, I'd say about 50%. Okay. Hey, uh, Andy. Yeah. I remember I've been to Cap's fly shop a long, long, long time ago. But I remember he was, he didn't sell any bait, any live bait, I remember, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. In fact, he was quite adamant about not selling wine live bait. And I remember, I think he had some kind of sign that says, we have no worms or something like that. Does anyone, <laughs> anyone verify that? Dan, you remember? Uh, I don't think that he had any worms or anything there. I could see him being adamantly, you know, he wouldn't want that at all. He, he explained to, to me, and I think Terry Cummings is on the line. I think he was near, and, and I remember him going into quite kind of a little mini discords, how it just kind of mess up his, he'd have to handle the worms and then mess up the flies or something like that, like soil, <laughs> they would be soiled or, or, or something uh, polluted. Well, the the yeah, other I night, like, I was impressed by that. I was impressed, quite impressed by. Well, the thing was, in principle, the boxes that were there, if you remember, his table was kind of a horseshoe. Uh huh. And if you looked at his flies, there wasn't one out of place. That okay. was Ed. Ed really, when he, he would take the boxes back and put the flies in, and you could. You could put a ruler up against it, and you wouldn't find one that was two yeah. sixteenths off or eighth of an inch off. I, and I remember there was like a, I thought there was a sign as you drove into, into the little lane, like, you know, kind of like, don't bother. The road, the sign was on Rocky Rip Road, and it said, if you're looking for worms, turn around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. I just Wish we that, had was, that, that was in about the, um, Maybe around 1982. Yeah, but thanks for clarifying that. But uh, they, the Fox Valley had a Zoom meeting the other night with Dave, the manager up at Tight Lines in Green Bay. And he said to this day, two, three times a week, people stop in looking for worms. And they've never sold a worm in their 20 years in business. <laughs> but he said they do it every week. So. Now is uh, this, this one is one that, this is, is, Ed's. Is this the one that was, was that Ed's? Yeah, this is 100% Ed's. This is the, I made, I was the one that made the uh, frames for these boxes. This is the smaller one. Because I if I go, if I go back a couple of, uh, it, that's okay, that's not the same no, one. That's one of yours though too in the background, all right? Uh, no, I think that I made four of the big and three of the small. That one that's there that you just showed, um, that one was made by somebody else to frame. Okay. But then I, like I said, I made them and, and I know a couple of people and made a couple boxes after he gave me my two. So. Okay. But was, on each of these boxes, on the back, uh, he would have a piece of paper naming all the flies on it. Nice. Wow. That's the big one. That's the big one? Yeah, see, that looks similar to that one that was hanging in the, yeah. in the shop there. That's very, very similar. And I actually have that, the one with the green, you know, he, I, somehow my dad got that one, George Close got that one. And so I have that green backed one. Oh, this, this one in the picture here? The one, yeah, right, right to the left of him. Yes. Sure. Very nice. Yeah. Cool. That's good to know. Uh, this is Duke sent us this. This is a collection he has. I'm not sure. Where'd you get these from, Duke? Well, some of those were from, uh, from Talisex and some of them were from the gas station at Langley. Okay. So the, um, Talisex killer, which is not a, it's kind of carved on or tied on a, on a curved shank hook. 
Uh, that was from the shop. Um, okay. I think the salmon mother was from the shop, and I, I suspect the old llama, the original llama was, and I think the others were from the fly shop. I've never seen an Uncle Otto anywhere else. That I've old never heard of it. <laughs> okay. Huh. I don't know who did the tying for the for the station. You, Dan? Uh, no, I'm looking at them. That could be an original sex uh, killer. Bobby well, thinks that was a dry fly. I always thought it was, well, they talked about it as a wet, but it's more like an emerger yeah. fly. No one had some, uh, it was late in the time of that Bob Telesac was running his shop. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't think Telesac, he might have tied his fly, but I don't think he, were, he was good enough to tie. <laughs> he more or less inherited all of Cap's flies. Yeah, Bob didn't tie it. Yeah, Bob didn't tie much, but there was a Jim Curry that Not supplied Curry. some of the flies to the to Mike Station. Oh. Are you guys familiar with a Jim Curry? Jim Jim Doc Curry, right? Yeah. 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 Um, he tied he tied a lot of flies. I think a lot of them ended up at Mike Station in Langlade. And then Jim Curry tied flies. He had a little. Um, space at the oh what was it called there andy the uh fishful, it was the fishful thinking fly the bear, shop at bear paw at, yeah that that's right that's right was that the bear paw outdoor adventure place there no his name was jim jim doc curry yep and the, and neil's neil's ham, hammer was neil sandwich's beadhead llama so it doesn't show right the trail and the other one Lower one on the Could map. I get the dates on, like, when when Cap dropped the shop, the shop, and when Ed, Ed Haggy passed, and when Talisek took over? I'm trying to uh, figure out when I started going there. Cap Cap Bittner started his in the early '50s, the fly shop. Well, that's before my time. <laughs> yeah, and he passed away in '84, I think, and I, I assume he closed it up a year or two before that. And I, I assume that's when Bob Talisac started his fly shop, which was right next door. Well, okay. hold on, Andy. It wasn't right next door. Oh, no? Okay. Oh. Correct. It, yeah, you're correct. Room. It was. It, it's there downstream was, a little bit. Yeah. There was a cabinet mm -hmm. next going downstream. I don't know who that was. But then the next one, that was Ed's. And you could go, I want to say, two more down. And that was Telesax. Tell it to go in Telesax shop. You couldn't go through the front door. You had to go around yeah. <laughs> the thing and come in the back door. I, and you damn well better not have your boots on because he was a stickler. <laughs> Dan, I was there today. Oh, there you go. I drove in the I drove in the Telesac driveway and you uh I was actually I was looking for something else. I was looking for that plaque. And, uh, but you're right. Between Cap's house, there was another cabin, and then there was Ed Haga's cabin. Okay. And then down river, another two or three was the Talisac fly shop. Okay. And I think when I was, when I went there in the about 1970s, I think there was just Cap's shop and Ed's house. That's the only thing I can remember there. Mm -hmm. Really, that. But I'm, old, but I'm old, so that I, I could be wrong. But the cabin <laughs> that was alongside from caps, it was really hard to see. And even from Ed's, that cabin was hard to see from the road. Yeah, you're, you're correct. The, la the last fly on that page is Doc Streeter, R S T R E A T E R special. I don't know who Doc Streeter is. But it's a kind of a similar to a uh, some of the main, the little mainstreamers that are so that have been so historically good, like a like a nine three or something. Uh, if, I don't know who knows Doc Streeter. I'll I'll fix that, Duke. Your writing is terrible, so yeah. that was my best guess. I just wonder if that looks a lot well, like one of the. If you look in that fly box, on the bottom there's a fly very similar to that. 
I mean, this one on my looks a little blurry, so I can't see the color that good. My focus is about as good as my writing. There you go, my <laughs> worse. <laughs> You know, I'm, I may be making this up, but I seem to remember Cap telling me something. He once had a, a pet cougar or something, and he used to have it chained to his arm. So in case something happened to him, it wouldn't get away and cause trouble. Did I, in, did I just invent that? Or? <laughs> I, don't don't I don't know. I remember one time going into Cap. I remember one time going into Cap's fly shop and his wife comes out and she says, hurry up, get in the shop. There's a bear between, oh. the, the, yeah. between his shop and the house. And I went in the shop and heard her looking through the little window. Hmm. But I didn't know anything about a cougar. I must yeah, I don't remember that. anything about a cougar, but I do remember him right in broad daylight, right at our campsite, shooting a porcupine out of a tree. <laughs> he, didn't like, he didn't like porcupines. <laughs> so uh, these two flies, these are Neil sandwiches. Um, the one on the left, that's his sulfur fly, which he had great success with. And I have had success with that too. I still have a couple of Neil's that he tied. And the other one is uh, the, the hammer. And it's you know it's a version of the of the llama. Um, he liked using woodchuck tail for that or woodchuck hide for that. And one of his friends called it the hammer because they did so good. And if you put a bead hot, bead head on it, then it's the sledgehammer. So mm. <laughs> that was one of those were some of his favorite flies. So one thing I remember Cap doing for sure. We were camped, and he comes creeping around with a 410 shotgun, talked to us for a little while and then cocked his head like he heard something and wandered off. And he, he used to get, uh, what was it? Chipmunks and flying squirrels because they used to get in the strawberries. And he told <laughs> us how many he shot and it was, there were an awful lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a recent photo. This was from last week. I stole it from a friend of mine and I just did it for the net. That's one of Neil Sandwich's nets. This was down the Southwest uh, last week or something. Guy was down there fishing. So, but it was just to show off the nets, one of Neil's. So when, when Neil passed away, his wife told me he had 1700 nets in the basement. Wow. <laughs> and he passed away in 2004. So, and she ended up, you know, contacting all those people that had sold them in the past. And uh, she got rid of most of them. No. And this is the green artesian. And I, I don't know for sure, but I, I, I think it was invented by Ed Haga. Yes, um, it was. Yeah. And this is it. And he used some, some different things. I don't know if you can see this, but he used rod building thread for the head. This is good broad. Uh, the classic, this is for, you know, real seats and and eyelets on, on rods. That's what he used. I have, also, a, I have a spool of that too. Yeah. And also the tinsel, that's a stamped tinsel, which is very hard to get, but they don't make it anymore. But I have a spool of it that I got from Russ Bulk because I was telling him about this because you can't get it anywhere. And Russ, who Russ, who's 70 something said, Oh, let me look at home. So he said he went in his dad's fly tying kit and he had, there was two spools of this and he gave one to me. So, and, uh, but, you know, and, uh, you know, fly tires substitute all the time, but it just, you know, I try to like the original stuff too. And I believe John Nabel told me that actually they dyed uh, head cement and then would coat the whole thing, you know, a light green, you know, put a little green tint, a couple of drops of dye in, a, in some head cement, mm -hmm. and then they would coat the whole thing too. This one doesn't look like it has it, but, and I do have, I have two original, uh, what did I do with them? I don't bring them here, of, oh, it's right here. These are originals, uh, green artesian, 
and I had never heard of them. And I took Al Gosha from Appleton uh, years ago. We went up the little wolf fishing brook trout one night and uh, Al's over there catching fish hand over fist and I'm not getting anything. And he, I said, what are you using? Well, he says, a green artesian. Why don't you put one on? I said, I don't have any. I don't even know what that is. Oh, here, give one, give you one. So as soon as he gave me that, I started catching fish. So. That fly is particularly um, effective uh, while the dragonflies are hatching. That's what it's supposed to imitate. Okay. All right. Well, you know, it's just a good streamer pattern too. A couple different color bucktails in there and so uh, big long hook. So interesting. And Jason, this is one of Jason's pictures his progress with tying a uh, closed carpet fly. Yeah, so I won't probably go through all of this, but um, I thought it was just maybe easiest because the webcam stuff doesn't always work so terribly well, but um, this, so closed carpet fly borrows pretty heavily from um, Cap's hair wing that, that Ed tied. Um, so the tail is essentially the same. The tail to me is always kind of the hardest thing to do. Um, the tail, uh, you really need a non-hollow deer hair so it doesn't flare too much. And then kind of the secret I'd learned from George on tying these is that you sort of release pressure as you get to the tail and then increase pressure as you move back. Um, so I tie in at the, I don't know what that is, third way back, <laughs> tie the deer hair in. And, um, and then you just kind of make crisscross wraps is what the back is. And then I know that George had always used, back then it was Dave's Flex Cement, was kind of the head cement that everyone had. And that kind of helped hold everything together and made it a little bit more durable. The next photo then is, so it's essentially just to compare it on wing. And Jason, then if you're- Jason, let me interrupt you one minute there. On that tail, Dan, was it was you telling me that- Yes. They used okay, to- I'll tell you something very few people know about. But Ed was having the problems that you just talked about. And what he used to do is he tried, if you use bucktail end, on the end of a bucktail, now those, those uh, are not hollow. Mm -hmm. But he also did is he used moose mane. Yep. Mixed in with it. And it wouldn't flare as much. And you couldn't tell if it was moose or deer hair. Yeah, and I think I might have used Elcock for these because it was the it was the best non-hollow hair that I had. So um, and then the last one is with the so essentially the carpet. And if you're looking at speaker view, hopefully you're seeing me, but um so the the carpet out of the cabin. I'm sure Sue can talk a little bit about that, but um, I know I've given away a bunch, but this, what, six by six piece, five by five piece that I have will probably last for at least a lifetime or so. Um, but it, it, Antron carpet fiber is tied in a, in a dubbing loop. And the idea that as George taught me to fly was it's the lower floating for those bigger drakes. So Cap's hair wing, which had all the hackle floated a little bit higher and the, um, the carpet fly then wrote was more of a uh, surface film fly. And there was nothing special about the carpet. It just, it came out of George Close's house is all that, so he kind of named it after that, right? Yep. Yeah, that's okay. right. So it didn't have any special scent from the carpet cleaner or anything <laughs> like that. So I, I don't think, think it was a scent thing, no. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think, I think uh, Ross Mueller covered that in his book too, if I recall. Yep. Yep, yeah, I remember did. it being Daycron fibers, if that means anything. I still have my piece of it that George gave me. I think I got two of them. That's great. Sorry, I had to leave for a minute. So uh, just while I saw a question here from Duke about do you use George's fly for others? So it was really kind of for a brown drake, but Certainly the gray drakes and the March browns, the any of those kind of larger flies. Um, they get that black drake on the wolf as well. Um, one of my favorite uses for it is um, 
The Efron hatch, I've done really well on a carpet fly, tying it using the white fibers. Hmm. So when you tie that, uh, it looks like you just tie it to imitate like a thorax and maybe some legs. Yep. When you're using uh, deer hair or coast or, you know, nice par properly selected fibers like uh, I'm thinking. Yeah, so the wing, I just use a um, like a coastal deer hair or a comparadon hair and try to get that compara wing for this. Right. And then you don't need a ton of the carpet fibers. It's probably like three quarters of an inch or so is generally kind of about as much as you need and three or so wraps. And I leave it a little long at first and then trim it. Could you hold it up again, please? Thanks. Thanks. Sure. I can. So that's the. You know, I can't see myself, so I don't know how focusing it is, but but okay. the carpet oh, that works. So yeah, and so it's just a real nice low floating fly. I've uh, oh, after George passed, I went up and fished with some friends on the Prairie River, and we hit the brown drake hatch up there. So. We all did fairly well on those, and it was really kind of a nice. Uh, it was a nice week to go fish with buddies and remember, remember my great uncle. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. You tie your wing on. The way Ed chose to tell me is you basically tie a reverse elk hair caddis wing. So you have a little bit of the ends hanging out, and I see that in your fly. Yep, yep, that's how Georgia taught me too, is to leave the butts for a little bit of flotation. I know when I used to do, I used to be with Federation for a while, and I'd see these guys from all over the state tie it, and I'd watch them tie, and that was the one thing they didn't do. Yep. They would tie the wing in first, then the tail. Yep. No, I, yeah, do the tail first and then the wing and then, um, yeah, and then the hackle or whatever you want to call it, the carpet fibers. And a friend of mine, Fred, had asked how long. I, usually you don't need a whole lot. So I would say like a quarter inch-ish, maybe three eighths of an inch. And then I tend to trim it so it's um, half the hook gap or less. So I want it kind of down in the film. And then as George had taught me to fish it, you treat the wing with a little bit of floatant. And that's really all it needs. So thanks, Andy. All right, we'll move on. Tell us X killer. These are, <laughs> these, were, yeah, these were just mine. Um, practicing this week a little bit. So yeah, some Talus X killers and kind of different sizes and shapes and um, a couple of carpet flies and a couple of uh, the hair wings. Cool. And uh, these are, I know the one on the left is an actual Ed Haga fly, Cap's hair wing fly that he tied. I believe John Nabel owns that. Um, and we use it, it's in good shape. We use it for all our photos. Am Not I supposed sure where to be able to see these from. somewhere? What's that? Are, are these flies visible to me somewhere on the screen? They should be. You don't see any flies? Where would I look? What are you seeing on your screen? Well, I've got pictures of several gentlemen here. And I'm trying to scan down. And I've just got more people. Yeah, go to the upper left and there should be some a little button to push and then hit uh, speaker view. No, upper right. Upper right, sorry. It uh, it has the word view on it. And then once you click on view, you should scroll down. It says side-by-side -side gallery. And when you click that, it should work. No, that's OK. Don't, oh, wait, I see them now. They're a couple of caps hair wing flies. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and the one on the left was originally tied by Ed Haga for sure. That, that is a dead, that's probably the deadliest fly that I've ever used. Yeah. For a dry fly. Yeah. Yep. Jason, you're up. Um, 
Yeah, so this, I just kind of did the same thing with the uh, progression. So the the tail again is exactly, so the, the tail essentially is, um, what do you want to say, George borrowed very heavily from, from Ed. So that's the same tail. Then the next set, you can't kind of see it, but it's a, um, a split deer hair wing, like a, uh, like a wolf style fly or whatever. And then the second one, I've got the hackles tied in and I tied them in just so the hackle stems were kind of long and I could tie them behind and in front of the, the wings. So between the wings. And then the last one is the, the finished fly. Um, and um, yeah, and I tie them, you know, a little bit of variation in how how high I want them to float or whatever you want to say. So how much hackle I put on them. So some, some are a little bit more heavily hackled. That's one of the things I like about tying flies is you can suit for, you know, if you want something that's not going to float so high, you don't put but five or six turns on. If you want something that floats higher, put on seven or eight turns instead. And, but it's a set, you got that name Adams cause it's got those Adams um, colors, the, the brown and the, and the grizzly. Um, and I know I'd read something. So in that Hornberg uh, fly fishers book, knowing reading through that again recently, which I've got a really cool copy that George gave me and signed. Um, that, that part of the idea behind the Adam's hair wing was that, um, that Ed wanted it with materials you could easily get and, 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 um, didn't have to have the greatest quality hackles and stuff like that. Cause at that time, um, certainly didn't have the whiting, you know, the whiting feathers and stuff like that, that we have nowadays. So, um, so the idea was kind of some less expensive hackles that, uh, that could tie these flies. And that's maybe part of tying in two hackles is you don't need such long hackles when you got two of them. Oh, thank you, that's very helpful. Jason, you wanna take this time and have Steve uh, demonstrate how to tie a caps wing? Yeah, which means Andy, you're probably gonna have to stop sharing and then Steve can yep. start share. Or yep. I will do yep. that right now. As we get to Steve tying this, um, use bleached deer hair for the caps hair wing and say a size 14 or 16. Awesome fly for the Efron hatch. So if you have friends in the right places, you'll actually have a piece of carpeting from George's. <laughs> I'm lucky enough to be have one of the owners. How'd you get that? Yeah, uh, mutual friend, eh? Yeah. And then uh, I get this beauty here, a cassette tape of um, Wayne Anderson and Gary LaFontaine talking about the Wolf River. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably purchased this in the mid nineties. Um, I just had started fly fishing and uh, Wolf River wasn't far away. And we would run up there and spend the weekend up there. And uh, I can remember going into a fly shop on Rapid Rips Road down there. I can remember going into a fly shop at the Bear Paw that was like brand new. And I can remember going into Mike's shop and trying to get all the information I could so I could find the best spot to go fishing. And at that time, I was on part of the uh, fly fishing list server. It was before message boards. There used to be a list server. And uh, Gary Borger was on there occasionally, but Henry Kamamoto from Wausau was on there. And anytime that those two would post, I'd read every single detail. And uh, Spent plenty of time chasing on the wolf, and I still get up there today because I'm lucky enough to have friends that own a cabin up there. But anyways, I've been tying this coast carpet, no, this uh, cat's hair wing today. And the trick seems to be is finding hair that doesn't flare too much. So in the respect of people's time here, I already started on, got my thread base laid down because I don't want the hair to roll on the hook at all. And then I took and put a bundle of deer hair and some moose hair together here. And I think I still got a little too much, but I'm gonna give it a try. But every time I do this, it seems to wanna to flare too much on me and I may still have too much on here. So then you just bring it back and you kind of 60 degree angle here and just small wraps in between. And that way you wanna get that segmented body. But then back here, you want to throw in some loose wraps in here to try to keep this tail tight. And of course it rolls on me a little bit. 
And then I'm going to bring it back and form that crisscross pattern that Cap's hair wing is well known for. And I usually carry a dozen of these in my box to this day because at the end of the day, when the light's getting really low, no matter what river I'm fishing, I'll throw one of these on. And my friend Todd Templin taught me that trick. It's a big bushy fly. The fish can see it from just about anywhere. And brown trout love to start hunting as soon as it starts to get dark out. So they'll come out and they'll nail it. And I picked up plenty of big fish that way. And having a big fish on at the end of the day is a great way to end the day. So next, I'm going to tie in my hackle. And just for speed, that pattern calls for one brown and one grizzly pattern. And I'm going to cheat and just use one Cree instead. You get basically the same effect because you don't want to see me tie in two hackles and juggle those around. And then I'm going to find some deer hair that I like. I've got about 10 pieces of deer hair laying here tonight, trying to find the right one that doesn't flare too much. Problem is I shot most of these and most of it's really fluffy hair. So I'm not gonna bother to even up these tips right now, but I'm gonna just get it on here. And it's not pretty, but it's gonna be functional. It's gonna catch fish. So I'll put the hair wing on like that. I've been playing with tipping it forward and tipping it back, trying to decide which way I like best. Um, you can take the time now and you can actually split the hair wing and create two wings if you want on it. But I'm not gonna bother with that today. Then I'm gonna throw a half hitch in here. I'm gonna take and use my rotary. And get some nice hackle wraps on here. And this is gonna be a little bushy, but this hackle is gonna cover up all those ugly tie threads and butts that I got underneath there. And then I'm gonna take and tie off my hackle. Whoop. And sure enough, I pinched my wing down. Take and I'm going to push this all back because I crowded my eye. And I have. This whip finish tool, it drives Andy crazy, so I use it all the time because he calls it the wrong fish whip finishing tool. And there is my sloppy cap's hair wing tying for you. So I, just as an, an aside on that, Steve, I, I have a Rinzetti now. Um, whip finisher, but I still have it. I, I don't use it much anymore, but I have one that George made, uh, basically a Renzetti copy. So he used to like to make a lot of his own tools. So I have a whip finisher that is essentially a Renzetti that, that George, had, that he had made and gave to me. Neat. You mind showing me how you use that? I've got one just like it. I can't get that thing to work for. I've shown Andy about a hundred times and I don't think he still can use it. Are you left-handed? Nope. Okay. Yeah. But you're looking that, at me. That would explain that. First, you, can, um, you can mirror the uh, the video if that makes it easier for people. The first yeah. Renzetti's, when they first came out, if you look at the N, it, the new ones have an S. And the old ones just had a C. <clears throat> you have the old one. If you're left-handed, you'll never get it to work. <laughs> that it, it's the S when you put the S in, then you can get both to work both ways. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's interesting. Yeah, so I'll start here at the fly. So I take that like that, bring this piece around like here, and then I bring the fly trailer edge around there. One, two, three, four, uh, bring it up, okay. 
drop this bottom piece and then you pull that piece down. Does that do it? Yeah. That looks yeah. completely different from how YouTube was telling me to use it. I have a hard time using the other one myself. For me, um, any whip finisher, whether you do it by hand or you use a Renzetti or one of the weird ones that Steve likes, um, it's, all, it's all about making that triangle. The, that triangle is basically what, do, what makes the knot. Yeah, absolutely, getting that done. I can do it with my hands too, and you know, time to time I will do it, especially on larger flies, because I don't want to take the time to um, build it up. And uh, if you're trying to go for speed, the less tools that you pick up, the better off you are. And if you, the other thing I always do too is I keep my scissors in my hand all the time. I have one of these offset anvils. Yeah, if you, if you the less time you spend setting tools down and picking up, the faster you're going to be. Jason and Steve, you guys trim out the bottom of the tackle. Well, Couldn't hear you there, Duke. You, you guys trim out the bottoms of the hackles? I don't, but you certainly could. Dan, what's your experience? The closest thing is George's fly, carpet fly. By the way, I want to say one thing. Sue, you look just like Betty. I can't believe it. One thing I've done uh, fishing is trim the, bot the bottom hackles off on the hair wing um, when they've wanted a fly sitting a little lower in the um, water or in the film, because um, I'm usually too lazy to change flies. So I trim the bottom hackle off, let it sit a little lower, and that's worked for me. Yeah. yeah, I bought one of those hemostats that has a scissors built in, so I can do that right on, right on the river if I want to. So I build them with full hackle and then trim them on the river if I need to. That's all I got. Maybe I missed this, Steve, but what size hook were you using? Or I was using a 10 because I wanted you guys to be able to see it as best as possible. <laughs> um, hopefully it came through. I got a pretty decent laptop, and it looked like it came through on my end, but I can't tell for yeah, you. That was good. Hey, okay, great. Uh, one thing I would uh, mention is that a variation on that that some of you may or may not be familiar with it was the exact same fly, except the thread was kind of a rusty orange, and that was the uh, brown drake imitator. The other thing I remember, he, uh, I think it was the flies I bought from Caps a long time ago, I remember had the rod, rod winding variegated thread, I remember. So I think that was used a lot on a lot of the originals. I know it's not true to the original pattern, but I've added moose mane um, to the tail and had it extend out past that deer body. And um, I use that when I'm in a lot more broken water, riffle water, and uh, helps the fly float a little higher in that uh, broken water. Jason, it won't let me share my screen now. It says host disabled participant. We cut you off, Andy. No, I left for a minute and then I came back. I wanna, I tried to do something, it didn't work, so. Down at the bottom, Andy, next to the chat, um, it should say security participants chat share screen pause recording if you hit no, share no. screen that might be it you should oh, be good now andy yeah this one here yeah. oh, good job zoom yeah i got a picture of zoom what it's there but that's not what i where were we there we go all right, sorry about that. Technical difficulties here. No, oh, it's not moving, no, Steve. It's not moving. Or did I? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
It's a good thing you got tech support there, Andy. Yeah, that's why I came here. <laughs> that's what I did. Okay. Um, this is where we left off. Um, what I what I did is I left and I went to pick, find a picture of a bear. We had conversations before about bears. Does, do you all know what's famous about Langlois and a bear? Bear caves? Nope, that too. That's not it. Does every, the older guys, you remember the movie, the show Gentle Ben? Yeah. With the little yeah, kid. Gentle Ben, I remember. Yeah, one of the bears that they used on the Gentle Ben TV show was raised in Langley behind the bar there on the corner. Walter's bar. And then it changed to Bob and Joni's bar. But Bob's dad, Ivan Walters, uh, I guess there was some cubs that were orphaned. Somebody poached the mother or something like that. So they split up the cubs. And Ivan Walters ended up with one of them. And he trained it partially. But then it, it ended up being on that TV show. And, you know, the TV show probably had six or seven different bears that they used. But that was one of them. So... And we talk about the Talisac killer. This is a Talisac killer that uh, Neil Sandwich died. Um, and it, it, from this, it looks like a wet fly. I'm not sure, you know, subtle difference between a wet fly and a merger, but I would think this is a wet fly. I'd still like that other screen back, Steve, that I had before. Uh, where I could see people. No, I did it. Hang on in just a minute there. I had people off to the side. There they are. So, and Neil was, you know, Neil tied. They weren't things of beauty, but he always said they worked. So, <laughs> which is more important. It, the, the trout liked them. And that's kind of what he said about his nets. He always thought these old things, you know, people buy these. He says, people pay me money to, buy, you know, for these things. He says, I just need something to do. <laughs> so there was a book written, uh, The Hornboard Fly Fishers, uh, edited by Don Larmouth. I think we talked about him last week, last weekend. But uh, Dan Farron was one of those that's on here with us today. Yeah, I started the Warner's group. What's that? I said I start. I and uh, Jack Kowalinski started the Warner group, and when we made the book, that was George, uh, Don Larmouth, and I were the instigators on that to do that. Actually, there were two books. They were basically the same. It's just that the first one ran out, and people still wanted it, so we made a second edition. George Close was the other one? Yeah, George was, he was, he, when we decided to make it, those are the three guys that were really instigators in doing it because they want, the idea of it was everybody had to write an article in the book or something to do something so it's not, five pages long. So, and it is, I think, I haven't looked at it, but I want to say it's at least 40 pages long. It has everything from flies, places to fish. Um, I remember Jim Fredericks used to, he did an article on uh, leaders, it's the ones I use today. And, and the version I have is 92 pages. Or 90, I was going to say that. I haven't looked at mine in quite a while. Oh. And the Hornberg Fly Fishers, that was a group of fly tires starting out? It was a federation group. We started We started out as a, uh, actually, I started tying flies at the Bay Beach Wildlife Sanctuary. I did a class there. And from the class, uh, the Hornberg started up and they helped me run the class at, at you know, there was 
there was, I think, a dozen original people that started it. Uh, Bob Hagland, uh, I can't remember all the other ones that, that were in it. Very Is the nice. book still in print? Uh, they, uh, the Green Bay chapter approached me a couple of years ago to reprint it. And there were still five guys that were on the board that I contacted and asked them, do we want this to happen? This was after Don died. And when I asked Trout and Limba, well, what you gonna do with this money? Oh, we're gonna keep it. I said, wait a minute. And anyhow, the five people voted and not to give it to them and not to uh, distribute it. Because I think it sold for around, I want to say $20 when it was first brought out, first came out. Hmm. But they went all over. We sent stuff to other states. We sent them, people found out about that actually George at the time, if you remember, went to uh, uh, New Zealand and he met a guy there. So he had to send a book all the way to New Zealand. Wow. Hmm. Cool. Thank you, Dan. Um, now we're getting into want to say the younger guys fishing. These are some flies that Zach Buchanan has tied and Zach's on here with us today. Do uh, you want to just tell us a little bit about these, Zach? Yeah, um, so on the left-hand side, you have um, a few different variations of actually what is all the same fly. That's uh, Russ Madden's Peanut Envy. And that's considered a jig fly. And I'll go into that a little more. Um, Long story short, they're articulated flies, and it just goes to show you can have the same "quote unquote" fly, but on a, with different uh, materials, different weighting systems, all that sort of stuff that create uh, they fit all they all fish different. Um, you obviously see some with the bead chain eyes. You see some with different head materials. They're all the same fly on the same platform, but um, they're all going to fish different. The bead chain eyes with those materials, it's going to act more like a swim fly not going to have so much head tilt down the one with the dumbbell eye that one's going to dive it's going to be a jig fly on the right hand side we have a fly i actually designed for the wolf river itself that i called the wolf hound um what it started off as is i was fishing the um gallops dungeon and i wanted something that imitated a leech and long story short that's what i developed and i've been fishing that fly for four or five years five years and it's been a super effective fly for me, particularly in high water. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so then we got into some swim flies. On the right is a Waters Cougar tease based off of Kelly Gallup's Zoo Cougar. Um, what Tim did, um, I know a lot of you guys know him, is he puts a bunch of lead or lead-free wire wraps along the body, which essentially nutrient neutralizes the buoyancy of the deer hair. So when you're fishing that fly, unlike a, um, most deer hair headed flies where they have some form of float recovery, when you're fishing on sink tip, that one's gonna be a little bit more neutrally buoyant. Um, one thing I wanna note, all these flies you're seeing here or on my, well, I got a bully bugger on in my vise right now, but all these flies are meant to be on, fished on a sink tip. On the left-hand side, you have um, my variation of what's actually a downsized uh, musky fly, an articulated uh, mini Buford. And you'll notice in my tying, I, have, I really love synthetics. But um, that fly, it, it's a, what's considered a swim fly. So there's no weight to that fly. The sink tip's gonna drag it down. You're gonna fish, you know, maybe a four, three to, five foot leader on it and the sink tip's going to get it down you're going to fish it with like a jerk strip retrieve or with um how you're stripping your line and it's a very aggressive way to fish 
Um, with these spin flies and these jig flies, when we're fishing them, there's a time and a place for both of them. Um, we're fishing sink tips. Very, it's not often that I bring out a floating line when I'm streamer fishing on the lake. When I'm in broken water, deeper holes, that's usually when I go with something a little bit of weight because I need to get the fly down to the zone that I'm going to trigger the, a reaction out of the fish quicker. If I have fast moving water, say I'm fishing Burnt Point Rapids, Kroll Rapids, Cedar Hemlock Rapids, wherever, I need that fly to get down because I'm hunting such a small zone. So I need that fly to get down. So that's where I usually go with something with weight. When I start getting a little bit more of that broken water, say like downstream Burnt Point or that stretch kind of from nor um, upstream of nine mile down past the bridge down through there, I can get a little bit more retrieved. The sink tip is going to have time to get down a little farther. I can fish these flies that are more buoyant at the depth I need. Um, I can also get a longer retrieve, which gives me more time to trigger a reaction out of the fish. Um, so that's two of the main differences. There's a time and a place. Um, I don't believe in fishing staying in one spot and we're overworking a spot, I'm going to hit the prime, the prime locations at the prime water as I'm fishing, and then I'm moving up. If there's a fish there, these flies are going to um, trigger a reaction. It's that fish is either going to react or it's not. I'm not going to waste my time on those fish. Um, now on the left, we got another jig fly. That one's more of a bait fish pattern. That's my um, S or MSM minnow. It's a real flashy fly. I usually only tie it in black and white. Um, those are my two most effective patterns on it. Gets down, lets me work the holes deeper. It's just a reaction fly. Um, and another thing on these articulated flies too, um, as far as hook locations, most of the time I'm getting a predatory response out of these fish. I'm hooking them on the front hook. It's a kill shot. That's what they're going for. Um, if I get them on the back hook, it's either going to be a fish sub 14 inches, like that um, S or MSM minnow on the left. That's a five inch fly. I'm either going to, if I get it on the rear hook, it's either going to be a fish sub 14 inches, or you're, I'm going to get this lazy kind of, yeah, swipe at it rather than a complete T bone. Um, Paul, I've seen your comment. Um, on a six weight, I fish a 200 grain head, seven weight, 250. On my eight weights, I'm usually fishing 280 grains, the 300 grain head. I like on the wolf, a uh, sink rate of anywhere from about a, a type five to type seven sink tip. Um, there's a bunch of different companies that make stuff like that. When the waters get low and I'm focusing more on small mouths, okay. say, you know, 300 CFS or less, I really like an intermediate line because the water is so low. Um, now on the right, we have another fly developed um, called the um, Three Lake Shake. That fly started um, basically is what I wanted to do is develop a synthetic version of that Buford. That Buford has deer hair head. It has float recovery. Um, you can see I got one on my screen now that I tied. Um, it's mostly synthetic minus the um, slop and that's in it. It's a synthetic tail, synthetic flash body, a little um, fox, inch and a half foxy brush, slop and collar, more Palmer chenille, three inch foxy brush, another slop and collar. And then I either use a flash bend bait fish brush or strung fuzzy fiber and ice dub in a um, dumping loop to create the head. So with the, so few natural uh, natural materials in it, this fly soaks up no, uh, almost no water. It's a four inch fly. I caught pike, coho salmon, steelhead, rainbows, browns, brook trout, bass. Um, it's a four inch fly, but because it's so so much synthetic, it sheds a lot of water. You could throw this fly on with the proper line. You could throw it on a five weight. I throw this all the time on a six weight, but yet it's a four inch fly with plenty of profile, plenty of swim. It's a swim fly. So with these swim flies, when you got something with lead eyes, it's going to jig. It's going to go up and down. That's what they do. It's going to jig, period. These swim flies, now this fly 
with the head design, it's going to create drag as it's stripped through the water. And then on the stall, with the hooks that I chose to tie this on, they're going to have momentum, which is going to give this fly a sideways profile. All right, and that's gonna that's a trigger to predatory fish. I don't care what it is, musky to brook trout. You turn, you get a fly that can turn sideways and give them a T-bone shot, it'll trigger them. And so on these swim flies, hook selection is a little more important than something that's gonna have lead eyes, a cone, bead head on it. Um, these are Arex hooks, they're a heavier wire hook, and the weight of the flies help keel it so they track it straight, they're not too heavy. I get a lot of wiggle, this um, synthetic tail, this Pacarini tail is on a shank by itself. So it can sit there and flutter in the current as I'm stripping it, but then, so that the whole fly is gonna swim, but then on the pause, I'll get that side shot and then it'll twitch. And then how I work the line, whether I use the rod or whatever, will depend on how it uh, swims. Now on the left, that's a fly um, called the GI. Um, stands for gitch itch there's a there's a backstory to that name but anyways that's basically a upgraded version a bigger version of my three leg shake same thing there's a lot of bucktail in it so it's not quite it won't stay down or get down quite like um three leg shake will but it's a bigger version fish as well um for all that on the other side now that's just another uh version of a uh, articulated buford um my biggest trout and bass on the wolf river have all come from on that uh, actually articulated buford um the next fly i actually have one right here in my vice too if andy wants to go to the next screen is the zh2o it's a zonker variation and the one thing about this this is another tim waters pattern um i tie mine a little different than tim does but one thing i want to note this fly will ride hook point out up my first 20 inch brown came on one of these the reason why this fly will ride hook point up is because there's lead free wire or lead wire wrapped almost all the way up that shank everything under all that flash i know tim uses diamond braid i like using mylar or ice dub in a dubbing loop that's all wrapped with wire and then you got the um rabbit strip which creates drag there's air in there that'll help keel it and then with the down, um, well, downturned eye naturally creates, puts the weight lower than the hook eye, helps keel it so it'll ride true ride hook point up. This is one of my favorite patterns in the spring just because it's a great fly to swing and it's a great fly to strip. And I also like it in the summer um, as a trout and a small eye, small eye fly depending on the water temps. Because when you get to lower water levels, I can fish this on a longer leader or say like a floating line and I'm not going to have such a big impact when I hit the water when I fish a heavy sink tip or some of these bigger flies or with lead eyes it's a big splat in the water and yes I've seen fish actually turn and go towards that spot it does I don't think it really spooks the fish but when you get the lower water I do think they get a little more spooky so having something that lands a little softer is um definitely something to have in the arsenal um, so we got any questions, any more, oh, cougar tees. I'll put the one in the vise I tied while uh, we were talking about dry flies. The cougar tees is a sculpting pattern. The ZH2O is leech, dace, um, thinner profile patterns. The cougar tees, it's another Tim Waters pattern based on, like I said, based on Kelly Gallup Zoo Cougar, lead wire up the wraps. One thing about this fly is if you see on my screen, it's a flat bottom here. <clears throat> Then I have a wide sculpin head to collar here, and then there's a mallard plank on the top. Long story short, that all helps the fly ride correctly and acts as a little bit of a keel. Um, and then you just have rabbit strip as your tail. I tie it down in the back. You don't have to, um, but tying it down in the back does help um, prevent some fouling of this rabbit strip. It's still going to happen part of life you deal with it but tying it down in the back does help eliminate it and i don't find too much how it affects i don't think it affects the action really um like i said earlier has lead or lead free wire in the body that just helps neutralize the buoyancy of the deer hair head 
Tim, as you can see, he ties his deer hair heads much sparser than mine because he more frequently fishing, fishes these on a floating line. Um, particularly early season, swing with some small strips, a really heavily weighted fly. Um, it can just be absolutely deadly. I do have a few in my box like that. But generally, I like a little bit more deer hair with the counteracts on the way to the lead wraps. And that, I mean, that's just stylistic differences between how me and Tim fish. Um, so, but this fly, if you were to tell me you had three flies to fish the wolf forever and only three flies, fly number one is going to be the Waters Cougar Tease. Fly number two is probably going to be my three leg shake. And fly number three is probably going to be a black woolly bogger. And if you gave me an option of a fourth, um, I'd probably go with Caps Hairwing. And the reason why Caps Hairwing is fourth is I honestly, I just don't get down. And I, I live here in the UP. I don't get down enough to be able to fish the hatches when they're coming off. If there's a hatch coming off, I'll fish it. If there isn't, well, I'm stream fishing. So that's kind of how that all goes. Um, any questions, comments? Let me just uh, talk about Tim Waters. Uh, Tim's dad, Jim Waters, was very instrumental in getting our TU chapter going again. Um, and Tim's fished the Wolf River his whole life, and he fishes hard. Um, one of the th good things Tim does is he keeps track of what he fishes and when he fishes. And I asked him for his log, and this is, this is a five-year log now. Uh, in the last five years, he's fished 285 days. He's got over a thousand hours. He's caught 741 trout, 621 browns, that's 83%, 81 brook trout, that's 10%, and 39 rainbows, that's 5%. He said uh, the year of 2020 was my best year for big browns. He caught 59 browns over 16 inches, and 15 of them were over 18 inches. So, He's, uh, yeah, he puts on a lot of miles. He said, I talked to him the other night, he, he wears up two pair of waders a day or a year. He's like, because he said, oh, I gotta, I gotta remember, I gotta order my new waders. And then sometime during the year, if he can't keep them patched together and mostly just cause he walks so much. He'll right. put it in her planning and he'll walk all the way up to, you know, Langland. So. So uh, speaking of, catching fish in, in uh, the fishery. I, we have a couple of uh, folks on the call, I think that may that, uh, have some knowledge of fisheries management. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have fished, I haven't fished the wolf in many, many years, but it's got this reputation of, you know, being warm in the summer and, and you mentioned smallmouth. Uh, and so I wonder if anybody could shed some light on the, pers the, the fisheries uh, you know, perspective from, you know, how's the fishery holding up compared to the past? Uh, the, the fishery is in good shape. Um, we're, we're based on our water and how much water we get. And we've had good water, which doesn't make it great for fishermen, but it makes it great for fish. The wolf has always been, it gets warm in the summertime. And yeah. those, those trout go somewhere and hide because we catch a lot of holdovers. They do stock, they stock in the fall now, you know, they stock 10 inch fish, you know, and Tim Waters is catching 18 inch fish. So those are, you know, four or five, six years old of being in the Wolf River. Um, part of the reason it's not what it was back in the seventies is they do not stock near as much. They're probably at 15% of what they used to stock. And that's why there was more fish. There was more fish to be caught. The fish are there. You got to work for them a little bit. It still has some good hatches, still gets warm. Uh, but the smallmouth fishing is exceptional too. And that's, um, the trout guys don't like to talk about smallmouth, but uh, they're there. They're fun to catch, you know. So I got a few, have some few notes on that, there. Andy. Yeah, is that Ray? Um, with the water, a lot of the fishing on the wolf these days, if you're gonna go out there and fish, you gotta cover water. We're talking about a fishery that has less than a thousand fish per mile. 
if you want to catch fish, you need to cover water. If you want to sit there and nymph the same run all day or only cover three or four runs, you're not going to catch any. Unless you got heads coming up, you got a hatch coming off and you can see your eyes, you got to cover water. Um, it's not, a, I fished with Tim a lot and it's not uncommon for us to cover anywhere from three to six miles of water in a day. We're not going to hit water that's going to be unproductive. We're hitting the best spots. And that's how we find to, to get fish in the net on the Wolf River these days. Um, obviously, water flow rates, ability. I'm a consulting forester by trade. I walk through the woods all day. I'm very, I can wade the wolf. I've caught trout on the wolf at over 1300 CFS. I know there's a lot of people that won't even put their waders on at that level. I know a lot of people that won't even put their waders on when it's at 500. Um, so that's one thing to be considered. And another thing is when these flow rates are up, you got to know where to go to catch fish. Cause there's plenty of spots where I can, I'll fish at a thousand CFS that I could take someone like, uh, I'll pick on Bill Levingston because I know him. I can take Bill out there at a thousand CFS and I know we can fish safely for two, three hours without having to worry about giving his wife a phone call saying he slipped in, you know, and you know, he's coming downstream. So, um, that's just one thing about the Wolf River these days is you want to cover water or find a hatch. That's about your two options. With that. One of, I, ha I have a question for, uh, I know we have some, some, uh, biologist in the group that actually may have some knowledge of the history, but my impression, and I, I, I this is from my, the seventies and eighties, uh, is that the Wolf River was kind of known as the premier, one of the premier Wisconsin trout streams or rivers. And it was, was stocked heavily, more heavily. And there was a strong connection between, you mentioned Milwaukee and Chicago. I'm, I'm talking about the, the 40s and 50s. Am I correct on that? Can anyone? Uh, yeah, you are correct. So uh, it was actually once known as one of the top fisheries in the US, I believe it was in the, 30s. Um, someone might else may know that better than me, but I believe during the 20s and 30s, the Wolf River was actually known as one of the top trout fisheries in the United States. I know uh, any other perspectives, uh, Ray or Scott, do you have any? Um, this is Travis. Um, one thing I'd like to say that I've, I've said this to, I think Andy and I have talked about this and um, when thinking about the Wolf Rivers, I've heard that over the years from other fishermen that haven't fished it for years, and they, you know, they talk to me about it, and they, well, I'm, you know, we just heard it's warm; it's just a bass, bass water now. And I'd like, to, what I'd like to add to that is um, the Wolf River. It's a system um, with a lot of significant tributaries um, that actually lead to um, high density, you know, a high density of spring ponds in the area. And so I think about it as a system, and these fish, they migrate unbelievable distances um, and there's always always a place for these fish to go for sanctuaries and they move in and out of the river into the evergreen into the other tribs they can go up these tribs into uh, spring ponds that are 46 degrees year-round they can move around they come into the wolf river to grow and they grow like crazy i believe in the wolf river so um, that's how i think about the wolf river i think about the, the hunting as being part of the wolf river um, and I think it's an incredibly complex, diverse, extremely healthy ecosystem. And it's, the system itself is full of trout. If you, if you think about it that way, this, the system, the Wolf River system is full of wild trout. And that's how One I thing I, I can add to what Travis is saying is these fish move throughout the system. Um, there's been studies done by the DNR that documents that um, it's no secret fish run into at the evergreen they run um into nine mile they run to where these springs are coming in but one thing i've even witnessed on the river is these fish migrate during the course of a day i've literally been fishing and watched fish come out of the shadows and move and swim across the flat into a different spot because of shadows or do some other cover for whatever reason these fish will move through the system 
even on a daily or an hourly basis. So <clears throat> that's one thing to consider when you're fishing the wolf is where these fish might be, what structure might be holding these fish. But it, and also to add, um, yes, the, the wolf has been famous for since the 30s and 40s. Um, they used to stock more fish, well, they, so which means you get more carryover. Um, oh. it, it was a popular place, and, and back in the 30s and 40s, the Northeast Wisconsin was the place to go fish. Nobody talked about the Southwest. Nobody even knew about the Southwest. Everybody came to the Northeast to fish, the pesh to go, uh, the pine, the pike. Um, there's a couple other ones up there, but you know, and the wolf being the, the biggest, I guess it got the best reputation. And I think people like Cap helped that along too, promoting it. You know, when everything I, we got. When I used to go up to the Wolf River, when my mother is way younger, I was basically in my 20s. We used to go and plant fish in the Wolf River, and we do it twice a year in the spring and the fall. And we take Herb's rafts and we dump like two five gallon pills full of trout in the raft, fill them full of water and float down the stream. And they, if I remember right, they used to put like each time 60,000 brown trout in the river twice a year. That's when it was, you know, I remember going up there and you'd, you'd catch a lot of the small ones, but uh, they did that twice a year. Yeah, yeah the, these days they're stocking about 20,000 browns and then whatever, two to one to 3,000 rainbows, I believe, because Travis apparently likes rainbows or whatever. But yeah, it's about 20,000 browns, and that's all we get for the whole year, 20,000 browns. And I thought for a few years that they, the DNR didn't want to plant the wolf. That's true. Um, there's well, people in the DNR that believe that this the wolf river mm -hmm. should be a – Smallmouth and walleye river. Right. I'm not even sure they do 20,000 anymore. Um, last numbers I heard from, like, I believe it was 2016 or 15 or something like that, it was 20,000, but it's made may have changed since then. Okay. So the on, but last, Last fall, it was uh, 14,000 browns and 6,000 rainbow at Hall in the up here, anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's all. <clears throat> yeah, so, guys, this is Bill Livingston. Uh, I just like to add one thing uh, about I think it'll be year number five coming up that the Wolf River got um, slot size on trout. And a complete reversal, you can now uh, not keep trout between 12 and 18 inches. And I live on the river and I live on a, a pretty popular access point. So whenever I see somebody fishing, I kind of hang around and make sure I'm, I'm at the cul-de-sac when they come out. And the report this year by the people that could fish because of the high water They've never seen better trout fishing in the last 10 years. And I think a lot of it has to do with the slot size that was started and the high water, of course, Mother Nature. So that's my two cents. That helps. Oh, I got to agree with you, Bill. Um, a lot of people don't fish the wolf once it gets above 500, more or less when you see it stay almost at 1,000 or above for a full summer. It's not going to get any pressure, and you're not going to get. Um, I don't want to, how to, I don't want to generalize too much, but you're not going to get all those deer fishing locals putting every 14 <laughs> inch in their creel when the water's that high. I wonder if uh, the, you know the water's a little more turbid too. Would it, are they less uh, less predated upon too? I don't know if I actually believe that because I've seen brown trout on the wolf come 25 feet to chase a six inch streamer and 13,000 CFS. So I don't think the predation really is affected by flow rate that much until you get to, at least until you get to start getting to flood stage. 
Well, but more water keeps the fish, more safer places to hide from the otters and the eagles and everything else. So yeah, especially the otter. The otters. The otters are really good at killing trout. So yeah, let's let's keep moving here. Um, Clyde Park is a longtime member of the Trout Unlimited and um, he used to hang around up at Caps and stuff. And I swung by his house today and I said, you got any flies that you tie that you like on the wolf? And this is what he pulled out. So I took a picture of him. So this is what he uses, his versions. I don't know if those any of those have names or if they're just streamer type flies. But those are those are the ones he likes. And there's a picture of Clyde. This is over on the uh, and uh, he was helping out with beaver trapping. We were getting rid of the beaver. That's one of the dams. There was several dams. I mean, that's holding back two and a half, three feet of water there. And, uh, you know, trout can't move through that. So he helped that one year, trapping beaver and then pulling beaver dams. And as far as I know, we've got all the beaver out of there and they've stayed out that I've heard. And this is Jim Waters. We talked about Jim, this is his dad. And Jim was very instrumental in getting the TU back together. And he was always, he was trapping with Clyde probably on that sh picture and such. So uh, it was a good man, we miss him. He didn't fish much, but he loved, he loved the Wolf River and would do anything for it. He worked lots of hours. And the storm of 2000 in 2019 in July, uh, they had that big windstorm. It went right through the upper Nine Mile Creek, which is one of our good cold water stream tributaries to the Wolf River. And this is a picture of Bill Livingston and John Rose. That's a road they're standing on. And we had a mile and a half of that that we had to clear. We spent, I think, seven weekends last spring clearing a road just so we could get to the river to work. So I'm sure we're gonna to have to do a bunch of that in the spring again, because all those trees you see in the back that are leaning are now laying in the road. So, <laughs> and Travis, I have no idea who this is, but I got this picture from Travis. That's the gentleman I took uh, fishing last, uh, it was third week of May. The, the meet and greet? No, or maybe the fourth week, week after that, I think Okay. All right, cool. And this is some camaraderie there with Bill and Mike and John. This is over, I believe, at Travis's place? Yes. What's the yellow thing on the table? Locator? Yep. Yeah, I was looking for my property corners. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Couple of experienced fishermen. At least they look like it. So this is... Uh, this is the Nine Mile Creek that I talked about. And back in the late 2000, or 2008, 2009, we hired a beaver trapper. That's the water level um, that we had to deal with. This is, a, this, is the, the, this is a Nine Mile Creek. This is the creek, if you can find it in there somewhere. But we had lots of problems with beaver. That was our beaver trapper at the time. That, that outline, that straight line in the back that looks like a road, that's a beaver dam. And that's just part of it. We took out, oh, we took out seven or eight beaver dams that were holding back five feet, five to six feet of water each. And in a, you know, a six mile stretch, that's a lot of headwater. This is part of the creek. So in the late, I think 2009 or 2010, we hired the US Fish and Wildlife Service to blow up some beaver dams for us. And this was part of it. They blew up eight of them. And then after that, this is the Green Bay chapter. TU crew came back to help us, you know, that's Nine Mile Creek. Uh, we were just doing some brushing on there and. Green Bay chapter gave us some big support there. And this is some, some aerial Google photos between 2008 and 2011 of the same stretch of river. And you can see the difference from the top to the bottom after we got all the dams out of there. 
And you can see that big dam at the bottom of the top photo in there. You can still see the remnant of it in the bottom photo, but um, in that area, that's actually the point there that we always talk about. That's the one that took us the road to get us in there. This is the one that, that Bill and John were standing right down in here somewhere. Maybe it was, maybe it was right here at this corner. And that was the, the brush that we had to brush all the way in there. That was just part of it. So we did a lot of work. We've, we've continued to do a lot of work. And this was the, uh, this was the nine mile from in the spring when we got started. So the water was actually still a little high, but it was spring water or early, early summer. But, you know, from side to side, from tree line to tree line, you know, where the green grass is, that was nothing but water at one time. It was a lake. So, and if you look in the far back here, all the trees that are gone, that's where that windstorm came through and knocked them all down. And the landowner had to, came in and had a clear cut then after that just to salvage what they could because they were all laying down anyways. And that is the end of the, my presentation. Um, sorry about that. One more thing I'd like to say is I don't want to miss anybody. You know, we talked a lot about Cap Bittner. His brother Herb was a very, very good steward of the river. He watched over it very closely, especially after, after Cap passed away. Herb passed away two years ago, I think. Um, you know, they were both born and raised up in Langley. Big family. I think, I think Cap was the oldest, and there was seven, eight, nine boys. Bill. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Plus uh, two sisters. And there's still one of them. I believe there were two sisters and Carl's eight or nine still boys. Yeah. Carl's still alive. You know, I think he is. Okay. I think he's in his mid nineties. Okay. He's the last one left, I think, isn't he? I think so. Yeah. And then we talked about Ed Haga and George Close, uh, Jim Doc Curry, who started his fly shop after, you know, Talisax went out, had his little fly shop at the Bear Paw. We talked about Bob. Um, Dan Farron, who was out, joined us tonight, was very helpful with this, you know, giving me, filling me in with information and stuff. And we talked about Clyde Park. Um, Neil Sandwich, we talked, he used to build the nets. But one person we haven't talked about is Helen Sandwich. And that was uh, Neil's wife. And back in 63, 1963, her and Cap and Herb were very instrumental in keeping a dam out of the Pearson area that some developer wanted to put a dam in so he could sell lakeside lots. And she worked with the, the state people and stuff and they got that pushed down. We, we owe her a lot. And uh, she's still around. She's probably 97 now. Uh, lives down in Oshkosh. So, um, and I hope I didn't miss anybody. They're probably, I probably did. And I'm sure there's other, lots of fishermen that fished it that, you know, that we don't know about that just came up on the weekends and fished and things. So Jason, that is all I have. Awesome. So thank you so much for doing that. I hope people had a good evening. Uh, learned a little bit of history which is kind of what I wanted out of this. I, I think that it's important we have this history. We recorded tonight, so we'll have this posted for prosperity as well, which I think is kind of a cool thing. So who knows from how long from now, if there's some history out there that people can look at. Um, I want to thank those that shared, Dan in particular, and, and then uh, Sue and Steve. I'm glad you guys could make it. And we can kind of all hang around as long as people want. If you got questions for Andy or anyone else, feel free to hang around. Otherwise, uh, once people start dropping off, I'll, I'll end this. So. Yeah, I'll hang around for a while. Thank you so I, much, I, Andy. I had, uh, you know, one, one thing to comment about was the fact that, you know, the native brook trout of Wisconsin, you know, um, evolved with the, with the beavers and I, I always wondered what the um you know kind of studies were with with beaver dams and how how the brook trout were able to to survive in that you know type of thing you know we're 
you know, as fishermen and, 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 um, we're always trying to take those beaver dams out and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying how, how does that go correlate with, with the brook trout populations and, and, well, I, and I think it's a cycle beavers. thing. I, I believe um, it's a cycle thing where the, where the beaver build their dams, there's high water above it. I think that's good for the brook trout, but then over time, you know, it, the, the trout can't move, you know, trout, trout are migratory fish. You know, all fish, are, I guess all fish are migratory in a, in a way, so. Andy, if I may comment, there's done some studies here in the UP about it. And from my understanding, talking to my local fisheries biologist is beaver dams can increase growth rates in brook trout if there's an associated cold water spring. So if you have a cold water spring, a beaver dam can basically create a spring pond, which will have increased growth rates, increased food, um, for the long term. However, if there isn't a stable cold water input to that spring pond created by that beaver dam, you'll see a temporary increase in growth. And after that, you'll see the trout die off and there won't be anything about it. Um, I know in some, like the wolf, for example, and a few other um, rivers in here in the UP, that cold water input that you get from some of these tributaries means more to the main system than might a few larger brook trout in a tributary. So there's a, there can be a little bit of cost benefit. Um, I agree. That's kind there. of why I said it's a cycle. I was under the understanding that when brook trout, I mean, when the breeders put a dam, that tends to concentrate the tannic acid in the river. And yeah, for a while it helps the trout, but after a while it diminishes. I agree. I'll just note too that the um, if you look at the DNR website, they're doing a study right now on beavers in Wisconsin. So expect that we know a little bit more here in a few years. <coughs> but back in the late eighties, um, or the, the late eighties, around 2010, on the upper nine mile, we took out uh, in a one year, I think we took out 120 beavers, which is too many. And it's a, it's in a very inaccessible place. So, you know, we had to hire somebody to go do it because, you know, people can't get there. It's very landlocked. There's some private owners, there's some big paper companies. So, you, you know, the access is terrible. Um, <laughs> we have good, our club has good relationships. <laughs> Um, so, you know, things got lax for a few years, the beavers came back. So we hired a beaver trapper and the first year he caught 67, I think, uh, in two months. And then the next year he caught 30 and he was down to like 20 last year. But it, you can really see the difference in the stream. And I don't really have better pictures of that, but uh, yeah, it's really made a difference. Oh, and there was one thing Tim said too. Uh, let me find it here. Tim does our water monitoring, Tim Waters. And there's no data for July because the DNR was all closed down, but in, uh, or for July of 2020. So July of 2019, which is always the warmest month, the wolf was at an average of 73 degrees, the nine mile creek was an average at 66. The hunting was an average of 68. Um, but he said the 2.1 degree difference between the hunting <laughs> And the nine mile, the nine mile was lower. He said that was the biggest one in five years. He said, so we, we're steadily, you know, with all the work, I, and I assume I'm gonna take credit for it. It's the work we've done on nine mile that is, you know, just getting it open, decreasing the water temperature. And, you know, I've got an old buddy and he's actually a retired warden. And he said, when he was in his twenties, they used to go up on nine mile and camp. And that's all they'd catch was, you know, 10 to 14 inch brook trout. You know, every spring, they, that's what they would do. So I think it can be that way again. And we still have more work to do, but we're, we're trying. So. I know that DNR in Southwest Wisconsin is removing browns to restore the brook trout fishery um, because the introduction of the browns will, you know, all of that stuff, good, bad, you know, take your pick, what, you know, what, what, what do you prefer? But um, I know that happened and it's happening in the, the drift list. 
Hey, I ran down in the bay. I'm my name's John. I'm from Madison area. Fished the wolf 25 years ago. Love it. Looking forward to getting back. Um, you've got some great spring ponds up there for brookies. But I ran down the basement when you when you did that net. <laughs> I got this net. Yeah. <laughs> it must have been. I'm going to say damn near 30 years ago, there's a guy who had a fly shop in Mount Horeb. Right when I started getting back into fly fishing, it was kind of, you go down this road and it was this little fly shop that was almost like a tree house. It was kind of up on this hill and it was this, you know, that was back before fly fishing was, you know, this, this big ragey thing. It was uh, Burn Lundy. Burn Lundy's Fly Lundy. Fishing Chalet. Yep. Yeah, I, I still have uh, a Winston rod that I bought from him that I couldn't afford it. I still, hell, I still can't afford it. Um, but uh, hey, I just want to thank you guys. This is uh, truly wonderful, the, the river wisdom that you guys bring. The, I, I had a question about how the heck, that's a fast flowing river. How the heck were they getting those streamers down? I mean, were they wrapping lead on those shanks and, and fishing them down and across or across and down, or were they stripping them through through holes? How, how are they fishing those? Tim, um, Tim Waters flies have a lot of lead. Okay. Um, I can it's also answer lead. that for you. Um, depending on the water I'm fishing, you can see this is a little, I still haven't named it yet, but it has a heavy weighted head, um, one of them flyman bait fish skulls. You're, this, these sink tips that we're using, it's not so much the weight of the head that we're concerned about. It's the density of the head. And a lot of times I'm fishing, whether it's my six weight with the 200 grain head or my eight weight with 300 or 280 grain head, the sink rate on these is about six inches per second is generally where I'm at. And then from there, I will adjust my fly choice based on the flow rates, the water conditions I'm fishing, the water type I'm fishing, holes and runs. Um, like I mentioned, if you know it's a little bit deeper, I'll run something with tungsten eyes. If it's more of a flat riff of water, maybe I'll run bead chain eyes or maybe I'll run something unweighted. Or So that's how that goes. And then another thing with these sink tips, you want a shorter leader. You're running a big fly. These fish do not care that there's a fly line. I never run more than a six foot leader on a sink tip or a full sink line period, period. Cause that, that I need that fly to be where that sink tip is. And so the longer leader I have, the more disconnect I have, the farther away my fly is going to be from the zone, which where the, you know, where my fly line is going to be. So I generally like to be between three to five foot on the wolf, you know, four foot kind of being my average. Um, there's a number of, um, you know, every major line company has a line. I've used them all and they all make pretty decent ones, whether it's Cortland, Rio, SA, um, they all make good lines for sink tips and it's all a matter of your preference and what rod you're fishing. I was just looking at those, those, those back in the day flies. They, you know, they look like the skunk and they don't no weight to them. They weren't throwing 330 grain heads, you know, they were... So, um, in any event, uh, great, uh, uh, great to sit in on this and listen to all you guys, uh, all the wisdom on this and uh, the history. So, um, what, one of the talk. things I'd I'll like to add about that, really appreciate it. One of the things I'd like to add about sinking a, of the uh, streamer flies is, you know, sometimes you have to um, target where you want your fly to be, where you think the fish is going to be and you cast ahead of that and then you let it drift and as it drifts it sinks and then it, you know and then once it gets to that point where you think that fish is going to be that's when you you know tug on that streamer fly and you know depending on how long you let it sink is how deep it's going to be and then at that point in time you know you you tug on it and that's when it becomes the streamer and it could be like three or four feet down versus two feet down, depending on how, how far up from that point you, you know, you casted. So that's a method I've used. If yeah, you understand what I'm saying. 
along that along that same line. So I was with George up on uh, Oxbow one evening, trying to hit the sulfurs, and they didn't really come off that night. But uh, this will show up little, just a little uh, woodchuck muddler was always one of his favorites. Fish it on a, just you know the dry fly line he had on, and it's just kind of the men's to get it to to sink a little bit and put it in front of a brown trout's mouth and got a 19 and a half that night. So you can you can do it by just kind of moving your line around. Hey, hey, real quick, is there much of a crayfish uh, uh, food population on, on the wolf or not really? There yeah. was yeah. when the water was lower, but since the waters got high, I used to be able to catch crayfish as a kid on the wolf and I'd catch enough for we'd do a crayfish boil every year. But now that the water's up and it's a little bit colder than normal, the crayfish populations aren't quite there. And another thing too, to kind of go with what Jason said, you can kind of see there's a black um, woolly bugger with a tungsten bead. When I'm dry fly fishing, I always have a few of these. And, and like Jason said, it, and like Nathan said, presentation, presentation angle, where you're casting to, giving an upstream man to put some slack and get this fly, you know, a weighted fly like this to sink. Um, that goes all into the nuance of your presentation to get these flies to fish where you need them to fish. To catch fish. What, what are the bait? Are they about uh, the, uh, the, 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 the shiners and chubs? And dates? Um, creek chubs, that's right? I mean... um, rainbow, I believe there's rainbow darters. I know there's dace in there. Um, Sculpin, okay. there's a lot of sculpin in that river. I've actually hooked, caught a sculpin on a dry fly that was a five inch sculpin. Um, caught it That's on crazy. A, a modified a cat fairway. Yeah, when you catch a five inch sculpin on a dry fly, it makes you wonder if my five inch, six inch streamers I'm throwing is really all that big or not. <laughs> um, but yeah, days, I've, I've actually wet weighted the wolf. If you're going to wet weight the wolf, I suggest wearing some sort of wand pants because every year I wet weighed the wolf and I'll weight it in shorts or swim trunks or something and I always have leeches on me so that's another thing to consider um I've had leeches on me up to four inches so yeah and I've caught crayfish up to five six inches on the wolf too so there's no shortage of a food source out there for them well then the, them black woolly buggers are be doing good for that leech pattern then. Right. Oh, definitely. Um, and another thing I might add is if you're out, say, the brown dra um, when you're out fishing the wolf and you, let's say you're looking for a hatch and you don't find it and you're going to go into your box, on the Wolf River, I've noticed that it's very color sensitive and it's very condition sensitive most of the year, bright day, bright fly, dark day, dark fly. But you get early spring and later into the fall. And I've had bluebird days and all they want is a black fly. And I've had days where it was like someone turned out the lights at noon and they've wanted a white fly. So when you're out there fishing, have a few different colors. Even if you think you're going to hit the brown drakes or the Ephrons or whatever, you know, have a few woolly buggers, you know, maybe brown, white, olive, black, yellow. Yellow is one of my favorite colors on the wolf. Um, just a handful of colors like that in your box, just in case. Um, and then if you are going out streamer fishing, olive and yellow are my two, the two colors I fish the most, then black and white. And then I would, I also always have uh, either a tan or a brown and then start in my box whenever I'm out on the wolf. I just wanted to thank you guys for putting all the time and effort into putting this presentation together tonight. It was fantastic. I just loved it. Before you started, I told my wife, I said, there's another river I haven't fished. <laughs> she goes, you're going to be a busy boy next summer. I said, that's right. Thank you, Scott. We appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for doing this. This was great. Good. Glad it worked out. So Jason, question for you on the recording. I'd like to, you know, I couldn't write notes quick enough for all the information you guys were throwing out there. Uh, yes, sir. Where can I watch that? This will be on our YouTube channel. So okay, I will, 
Mike will do that for us. Um, <laughs> see if Mike's still paying attention. Um, yeah, so we'll get that. We'll get that posted to the YouTube channel eventually. It takes a little while usually for it to, to rectify and send us a link, but hopefully by the end of the week, it'll be up and we'll get it posted somewhere. Andy, I was wondering if there would be a way to get, uh, well, I don't know, maybe the guys would want this, but like addresses or and emails of people um, that's on this group. So if you go up fishing someday, you know, you could put something out on the email saying, hey, I'm, I like for me, I live in Green Bay, so I'm always looking for somebody to go fishing. You know, the, the wife, I'm, I'm 73. And the wife don't like me going out too much, too far away. <laughs> so <laughs> anytime, Dan, I think I, for myself and Bill and Zach and Travis, I believe we're on the, the uh, club website, wolfrivertu.org. And I think our emails are on there too. I haven't seen them. Uh, I'll have to go look again. And we're in the process of redoing our website, right, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> put him on the spot yeah, so, yeah uh this is bill again uh for anybody that's watching uh i live on the wolf river on the end of howard lane just up from the uh highway 64 bridge and uh just give me a holler uh always looking for somebody to fish with long as the river is under a thousand foot right uh zach Oh, come on. I could get you out there at 1300 if you had a pair. <laughs> you yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll I got to talk to your wife about your life insurance policy first, though. <laughs> you know, one okay. of the things that I, I thought about doing was putting together, um, you, you know, we have these uh, Facebook groups and, and things like that, but just some type of social media fishing buddy. Uh, type of thing where if you're going to go out fishing you know not you know you see them about tying flies and about this and that and the other thing but just if you're going to go out fishing if you want a fishing buddy to go out with you can post saying hey i want to go out fishing who wants to go you know and and i know there's a lot of guys um a lot of people in this in this chat that are that are into the technology thing and um if we could figure out a way to do that, I think it would be great. Well, you can use Facebook for that. And, you know, we need to get this COVID thing behind us too. And hopefully we'll have our dying event in, in January. And we always had a meet and greet, which was very successful. Hopefully we'll get that going again. I don't know if that's going to happen this year, but, uh, you know, it might be another year. But Yeah, and since... Since Andy mentioned the COVID thing, that was kind of how these things came about. So it was kind of a chance for people to get together from different places and do something a little different. Um, Facebook, Instagram, if you guys have ideas on future ones, look for a post sometime this week about other ideas we're gonna do. Um, so Duke and some others will be leading Wisconsin flies next week. So the probably the llama and a pass lake for sure. And a few others in two, and that's in two weeks, sorry. Then in two weeks after that, we have um, Scott Grady, who's our rod builder, who always does a lot of stuff with um, Fox Valley to you and Wisconsin Trout Unlimited is going to show how to care for rods and then show how to build a bamboo rod. So that's kind of the hangout in a month from now. And then we have probably two of them in March, I think is what's going to be the, the last two. And then that gets us into spring when people are going to get outside a little bit more. And hey, Jason, I'll, Jason, you know, I've been getting a lot of questions about um, Euro nymphing. I got lots of people and a lot of people that are, are longtime trout fishermen. That they're just not ready to take the big step into that. And we, you know, my question is going to be, are you going to volunteer? Sure, I'll volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, mean, I, I it, just, it's, it's, it's another tool that people ought to have because I mean, it ought to be outlawed. It's that good, you know. I, I'll get a hold of you, Scott. I got your email. Um, okay. The 6th and the 20th of March are open right now. So if um, otherwise, you can shoot me an email, too. I know you got mine through Andy. Yep. and yep. To, to add to the whole uh, Euro nymphing thing, I know there's a lot of guys in the Fox Valley TU that do that. But um, 
you know, we had um, Dave from Tight Lines who gave a, a thing about um, Pyramid Lake in Nevada. Okay. He, one of his other options when, when I talked to him was about hero nymphing. So it might be a guy to uh, talk to. Um, you know, Dave, he's the new uh, um, manager at Tight Lines Fly Fishing in the Pier. Um, he might you be can just call him the new Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. I've yes. Yeah. Him. The new Charlie. I've never <laughs> met him. I don't think when I he'd read about great. him. And, um, and uh, he'd be a good one to invite to, um, you know, maybe do a pattern or two. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. He talked about saying, you know, he would do something on, you know, Euro, uh, you know, tight line fishing or whatever, how, however you want to call it. But yeah, he would be a guy to talk to about that. It is deadly. It is <laughs> deadly. And I'm not sure patterns are the, are the biggest key to that thing. I think it's putting the fly right in their face and all they got to do is open their mouth, you know? Uh, it's sort of like dead drifting nymphs, you know, out west. Um, you yeah. know, get them, you know? <laughs> there are, there are uh, yeah, we could go on all night on this because for me, I found that tying those super heavily weighted things on jig, jig hooks, you know, just seems like a stone. So anyway, I don't want to spoil anything for the future. Um. If anyone ever has any questions, you can reach out to me. My email's on the uh, chapter website, and it's any of our chapter newsletters, which you can also find <laughs> online. My email's out there. If anyone ever has questions, you can get a hold of me. And I actually live in Newberry, Michigan, up here in the UP. So if anyone ever has questions about fish in the UP, uh, if you want to catch wild native brook trout on dry flies or classic patterns, or you want to rip, rip seven inch streamers for trout, Shoot me a message and I can point you in the right direction. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. No Thank you. I love fishing that Ontonagon up there. I haven't fished the Ontonagon yet. I fished the iron, but I'm way on the east end. So I fish like the two heart, the fox, the quamanin, stuff like that. So well, Zach, have you fished St. Mary's there in the on from the Canadian side? I haven't had a chance Wild. this year. I was all I was all set up and I was literally ready to go because I got some friends that live in the Sioux. I was going to crash overnight at their place, and then COVID happened, so that all fell through. So I'm still biting at the bit to get on the St. Mary's and fish for Atlantics. I did a little bit of trolling with a coworker for Atlantics, but I'm still looking to get over on the rapids. I didn't but. do any good, but it's a wild experience and all the locks and. The yeah, that's what I've heard. I know um, one of my favorite things to do in the fall, not that I really should be spouting my mouth off about it, but uh, I'll go fish the surf in Lake Superior near the mouth of the Two Heart and uh, rip streamers for coho and um, catching coho in Lake Superior in the surf on streamers is uh, certainly a. Uh, You're killing it. What are you? We're not going to sleep tonight. Come so, on. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna cut in here real quick and just say um, if I think since we're out of wolf questions and stuff, I'm just gonna stop the recording and we can continue to uh, BS and such. But I think that's a pretty good place to end that recording. So.